Hello and welcome. Today we've got a very insightful talk entitled Monitoring Tumor Microenvironment Immunotherapeutic Impact in Heterogeneous Cancer, Prostate Cancer, Spatial Transcriptomics, and a Novel Therapeutic Target, B7H3, with Dr. Eugene Chenderoff, Assistant Professor of Oncology and Cancer Research Immunology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medical Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. I'd like to hand over the talk to Dr. Chandra. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to present at Lab Roots, and uh, on that note, I'll take it away. Uh, these are my disclosures. Today's overview of the talk will be about prostate cancer, about the role of B7H3 potentially in prostate cancer immunotherapy, some clinical work we're doing to try to elucidate its function, discuss how we're exploring the tumor microenvironment using the nanostring Geomex Deep Spatial Profiler, or DSP, and then just wrap everything up together. So prostate cancer as an overview, it's the second most common cause of cancer related death in men. It causes approximately one in every 48 American male deaths a year. It's obviously the most common cancer in men as well. Metastatic prostate cancer has a median survival of five to 10 years if a man progresses to that stage. And most men who progress that far will tend to die of the disease. Unfortunately, to date, the immunotherapy revolution has really not revolutionized prostate cancer. CTLA-4, PD-1, PD-L1 axis therapies have not had significant objective responses in prostate cancer. Even when used in combination, the results are still limited. Partly this may be due to PD-L1 low expression in prostate it could be due to other factors that are yet unknown. But overall, we know that an alternative immunological approaches are required. The natural history of prostate cancer in 2021, starting with localized disease, is surgery and radiation for localized disease, progressing to androgen deprivation as one has non-castrate recurrent disease after localized therapy if it occurs, going on to additional hormonal agents, add on to initial androgen deprivation therapy. And then as men progress through castrate resistant settings, there's chemotherapy, and then there's the post-chemotherapy space. And unfortunately, after that, most men will have few treatment options. So immunotherapy is something that is greatly needed for prostate cancer, just as it is for other cancers. We know from evidence in the field that, unfortunately, the response rate to even pembrolizumab or PD-1 agents in a large trial uh, presented in JCO in 2020 showed that, unfortunately, for three different cohorts of men, either men who are PD-L1 positive, men who are PD-L1 positive or negative with bone disease, or PD-L1 negative, regardless of their PD-L1 status, the overall response rate was quite low. It was between 2 to 5%. As shown in the graph, the overall survival was unfortunately not significantly improved by any of the therapy lines um, for more than about 20 to 30 um, percent of men over time. And we know we can do better. The promise of immunotherapy, as highlighted in the science article uh, from 2013, where cancer immunotherapy was a pearl that is a breakthrough, which it is for many cancer types, in prostate cancer has not yet been met to date. We know that the immunological synapse, as shown here, has numerous targets. Some of them are well characterized at this point with numerous uh, clinical FDA approvals like CTLA-4 and PD-1 axis therapies. B7H3, highlighted in the red box, is a novel target, also known as CD276, in the B7 superfamily. Um, it's also known as PDL3 compared to PDL1 and 2 that are well known at this time. We don't know its receptor, but there's emerging evidence that it's got an important role in prostate cancer. We know that there's 
pretty significant expression in prostate in terms of mRNA, but even more so by protein of expression of B7H3 in the normal prostate compared to other tissues. Additionally, we also know that B7H3 in prostate cancer is one of the highest expressing cancers. So prostate cancer has a lot of B7H3 in the tumor microenvironment, as one can see on the graph here. So potentially, that makes it a target to explore further in prostate cancer. As shown here, using two different cell lines, on the left, HBTB119, that's known to be negative for B7H3 expression on the right, GMT1, we optimized IHC staining to show on the right side, the prostatectomy FFTE section, that benign glands in prostate, as we showed in the earlier slides, have some B7H3 expression, but tumors express tissue expresses quite a bit of B7H3. One would call that hot expression in a sense. So B7H3, we kind of already talked about that it's in the B7 superfamily, whereas prostate cancer or prostate expresses a low amount of pdl one B7H3 RNA is in the top one-fifth of genes expressed. B7H3 transcripts have been shown to be upregulated in multiple types of tumors, and again, ubiquitously on prostate cancer. Multiple reports show a correlation between B7H3 expression and adverse pathological and clinical outcomes in prostate cancer. And finally, inhibition of B7H3 seems to limit tumor growth by enhancing cytotoxic lymphocyte function, setting it up as a potential checkpoint target of interest in specifically prostate cancer, in addition to other tumor types. B7H3 protein expression is known to be controlled by microRNA-29. There seems to be an AR binding site upstream of B7H3, which is actually novel for any other known ch potential checkpoint target. And also, it seems that B7H3 expression seems to remain stable in response to hormone therapy or even potentially increase. And finally, we don't, don't know the crystal structure of human B7H3, and the receptor remains unknown. So a lot of research yet to be done on this. B7H3 seems to negatively modulate cytotoxic T lymphocyte function in non-small cell lung cancer. And its response was to anti-PD-1 therapy, as shown from a recent publication uh, by Anasaka et al. in uh, 2018 and highlighted here. Furthermore, recent work from uh, Benson et al. at uh, Johns Hopkins in 2017 showed that on the left graph, B7H3 has significant expression within the prostate compared to PDL1, 2, and 4. And on top of that, men who had high B7H3 expression had worse outcomes in biochemical recurrence and metastatic disease settings, which means that if one can potentially target B7H3, it sets it up as a possible checkpoint inhibitor akin to PDL1 or CTLA4 with better outcomes if one can blockade it if or target it. Um, in other means. So we capitalized on the fact that uh, Macrogenics, a company we partnered with to do a investigate initiated trial, created the first in class anti B7H3 targeted monoclonal antibody with optimization for ADCC, antibody dependent cytotoxicity. And it's called enoblatuzumab in the clinical trial as shown here where we basically used men with who were diagnosed with prostate cancer of intermediate to high risk stage who received six doses of enoblatuzumab in a neoadjuvant or window opportunity setting prior to prostatectomy and then they were followed up for up to three years some men are still in follow-up to try to see whether enoblatuzumab therapy before radical prostatectomy decreased micrometastatic disease, as would be noted by freedom from PSA recurrence at one year. And also, since this is a early phase two trial, to look at safety. 
And this was a very correlative rich trial with blood and tissue collected pre, on, and post treatment. And that allows us to really do a deep dive into trying to understand B7H3 pathophysiology and the mechanisms of response resistance to B7H3 in terms of the immune tumor microenvironment effect. What we initially noticed um, is that if one looked at preprostatectomy PSA compared to screening PSA, the biochemically was a number of men on the right side of this waterfall plot who had PSA decreases that were greater than the red line shown, which is greater than 10%, which could be related to what one would think is not what we historically see in such a short window of time with no therapy normally. And so that could be indicating there's some tumor microenvironment changes happening from the impact of enobutuzumab. Very briefly, we grade prostate cancer using Gleason grading system. And as shown on the left side, normal prostate cancer has intact basal cells and intact architecture, and as you progress to grade three, four, and five, you lose the architecture to more of a sort of non-architectured loose cell pattern. And so what we also noticed, it's highlighted here, is that compared to biopsy on prostatectomy, treated patients compared to one-to-one -one matched controls as shown herein, had quite a few changes in terms of their Gleason grade. We don't quite know what to make of this on its own in the field. There could be changes related to just biopsy to prostatectomy, sampling, or even fixation. However, because we have a control group and this seemed to be a statistically significant change, this tells us that possibly there is tumor microenvironment changes occurring from the impact of enoblutuzumab that required further understanding. Additional clinical data is still maturing. So we will continue with looking at the tumor microenvironment. So we wanted to look at what was going on there to explain the findings we just showed. Well, we know that prostate cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. There could be areas of normal glands interspersed open eyes, interspersed with tumor, and it makes it difficult to really interrogate benign versus tumor. As shown here in an FFP IHC slide, there are CD8 cells highlighted and carcinoma air glands highlighted. And sometimes the CD8 may or may not be anywhere close to a carcinoma gland. So if one wants to, for example, understand CD8 infiltration pre and post treatment, one has to also know where the carcinoma is and where the benign areas are and what they're comparing. So tumor to tumor pre and post treatment, for example. So if one zooms in, here you can see that these are CD8 in close association to tumor glands, so tumor infiltrating CD8. Well, one of the ways that we really wanted to take advantage of the ability to really combine cutting-edge research in terms of the clinic setting with cutting-edge research in terms of what's available to interrogate uh, tissue really at the spatial level is we partnered with Nanostring in order to utilize the deep spatial profiler to see if we could better understand the local tumor microenvironment between benign and tumor areas of prostate pre and post treatment. As shown here, the DSP is a system that allows one to use imaging reagents and profiling reagents for both proteome or antibody staining and as well for transcriptome or RNA staining, and then select regions of interest in a few different configurations, which we'll talk about, shine a UV light onto those regions of interest that cleaves UV cleavable barcodes from the antibodies or probes. You can aspirate those up and basically, per those regions of interest, understand what your either protein expression is or RNA expression is, giving a very powerful tool to really delve into again, the tumor or the benign changes pre and post treatment as is shown for this trial, for example. 
And so there are a couple of modalities one can choose. You can choose based on the way the equipment is set up, geometric, segmentation, cell type. I want to know within a region of interest, different cell types, say CD8 versus CD68, or contours as shown here, or a gridded pattern. We will describe that we chose a geometric pattern, sort of looking at tumor areas versus benign areas, not knowing what was going to be happening with this sort of first in human study of B7H3 targeted therapy. We just wanted to see what are the impacts that we're seeing uh, between different patients and their pre and post tissue. One can think of spatial dynamics as they are having different cellular compositions. And within that, the spatial distribution of how cells are distributed compared to the tumor can impact how those cells are acting or not acting in terms of the immune microenvironment. So for example, shown in terms of the spatial distribution right side figures, you can have immunosuppressive cells, you can have activated T cells, but they're excluded from the tumor microenvironment, or you can have exhausted T cells. So it's not enough to know you have a CD8 infiltrate. Is that infiltrate active? Is that, does it, for example, express granzyme B, a marker of activation? Or are there FOXP3 cells, or also known as Treg cells that are immunosuppressive? And so a spatial approach to tumor microenvironment assessment is quite important. Actually, the technology itself, the whole idea of spatial transcriptomics was assigned as met a methods, uh, nature methods, method of the year for 2020 due to the power of what it opens to the field as a whole. And so as shown here, this is an example of a patient's prostatectomy tissue. Squares show tumor areas and circles show benign areas. We basically, using equanimitas, just highlighted some tumor areas, some benign areas, and tried to stain for either CD3 or T cells, CD68 or macrophages, set a keratin to identify tumor or DNA, and then with 40 different oligoantibodies to try to understand protein expression pre and post treatment. Now, we can zoom into these areas. They kind of look like this, so the circle is benign on the right, and then the tumor is in the box blow up on the right as well. And we can zoom in even further and one can see that we can see set of keratin cells in red and green, which would be the tumor, DNA for the nucleus and CD3 in red, as well as yellow for CD68. With a very nice resolution and also down to understanding within any region of interest which cell types we have and quantifying them. So this is kind of just for that one sample, for example, the 10 tumor areas and two benign areas are highlighted. So what did we see? Well, the power of using a multi-omic technology is the fact that, again, one can get information not just about the cell type that's infiltrating, but potentially about the activation status or not of that cell type about using multiplex technology, like what we were describing with a 48-plex panel, additional cell types, saving tissue, of course, from doing single-plex IHG stains, and saving time with being able to do multiplex. Now, there are other technologies that you can, one can do multiplex immunofluorescence. In this case, we have four guiding immunofluorescent probes. There are technologies that can go up to nine to 10 or even more, one has to deconvolute the signal, and again, once you go above a certain number, it becomes very hard. In this case, you can go to 40plex, since it uses barcodes, that really gives quite a bit of power. And again, for the purpose of this talk, the technology that we chose to use. So what's shown here is that pre enoblituzumab or biopsies, compared to post enoblituzumab or the prostatectomies on this trial, there was even after accounting for multiple comparisons, quite significant p-values in terms of the CD8 infiltration. The CD8 cells appeared to have 
granzyme B activation, I will caution that because one looking at the entire tumor microenvironment within a region of interest, we don't know that the granzyme B is tied into the CD8. So it could be other cell types like the CD68 or any other activated myeloid or T cell in the region. But we also saw then that the granzyme B increased, so there was some increase in activation of certain immune cells in that same area. PDL1 increased and PD1 increased, which all indicates some degree of interferon gamma mediated activation or kind of the tumor turning a little bit warmer or hotter, colloquially speaking, in terms of the activation status, which is interesting. And so to go in a bit further, we wanted to know, for example, is that CD8 noted increase potentially an artifact, or is it related to specifically the fact that we actually see a CD8 infiltration, as an example, of one of the markers? And so using gold standard singleplex IHC, shown on the left, versus the nanostring CD8 for a subset of patients, 13 of the initial 32 patients on the trial that were accrued, we show that basically compared to untreated controls versus treated in terms of untreated are black and green dots are the treated, we see almost a very similar distribution between single-plex IHC CD8 and CD8 nanostring-based quantification, which gives us a high degree of confidence that the findings we're seeing on the DSP are what's actually occurring in the tumor microenvironment. Now, we did mention that we used a 40-plex panel, which means that we also have a way to look at more markers simultaneously than just CD8 or just granzyme B. And so here showing a volcano plot, which shows fold change on the x-axis, so towards the right is increased expression in prostatectomy samples versus on the left increased expression in the biopsy pretreatment samples. And on the y-axis, the p-value, one can see that quite a few of the markers, and this is not uh, unexpected, are increased. This is a 40-plex panel chosen for proteins related to immune activation, and since we see a bit of immune activation, they're kind of all skewed towards the right. Some of the dots obviously are not significant and shown in gray. Some of the dots are statistically significant after adjustment for mixed model analysis and are shown in light blue. And then if the fold changes over twofold, on the x-axis, then they're also shown, and statistically significant, they're shown in a darker color. And so one can see that there is upregulation of what appears to be granzyme B, as well as some other markers, CD45, CD163, FOXP3, which, and then of course there's things that have lower fold change but are still statistically significant, which tells us possibly some or all of those are truly upregulated to a biologically uh, important degree. And one can also see, for example, PD-1 is not meeting the full change greater than two criteria, but it is highly statistically significant. So it's telling us there is some degree of T cell and what appears to be myeloid immune activation within the tumor marker environment, which again, with the first-in-class agents, is interesting and something that we're putting together further for uh, publication in the near future, telling us that there is definitely something going on post this treatment with this antibody optimized for ADCC. Now, we have no idea if the antibody itself is blocking or not because, as highlighted at the beginning of the introduction, we don't know what the receptor is for B7H3 and we can't do blocking studies in that regard or occupancy studies. Um, for blocking purposes. Using the nanostring IO360 panel to look at RNA expression, and in this case, between one-to-one -one match controls or untreated prostatectomy patients versus the treated prostatectomies from treated men, 
compared to the previous volcano plot, which was longitudinal pre-treatment biopsies to post-treatment prostatectomies within the same individual comparison. Here we see that between treated and untreated controls, again, there is a recapitulation of immune changes indicating higher and treated of various immune functions like IL-18, HLA-DR, indicating some presentation changes, uh, lysozyme 96, and so indicating again that there's some degree of myeloid activation potentially. Consistent direction changes between the two different analyses. Again, a significant additional amount of work is ongoing, but as highlighted here, quite interesting preliminary tumor microenvironment signals showing some degree of TME impact from the drug. So in conclusion to this brief talk, B7H3 a place to play an important yet undefined role in prostate cancer. New adjuvant B7H3 monoclonal targeted therapy appears to be feasible. We didn't go into the safety, but it was a relatively well-tolerated drug for this trial. Demonstrated potential efficacy in prostate cancer. Again, we didn't go too much into the overall efficacy. We talked about the pretreatment um, to immediately prior to prostatectomy PSA changes and also a little bit of the Gleason changes from pre-treatment biopsies to prostatectomies. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of identifying the receptor for B7H3. Metastatic B7H3 targeted antibody drug therapy is being studied as well. Um, and spatial proteomics and transcriptomics is driving insights into B7H3 immune roles, as highlighted herein, with preliminary data indicating that there is a robust intratumoral induction or adaptive upregulation of immune checkpoints, potentially T cell activation, and potentially myeloid inflammation. More needs to be understood, again, for example, even for the myeloid inflammation, whether that's beneficial myeloid inflammation or some degree of adaptive myeloid inflammation to the T cell activation. Again, more work in this space uh, is ongoing. On that note, work like this first and foremost occurs thanks to the patients who give us the opportunity to try to treat them with the next generation therapies that can hopefully meaningfully impact their disease. So to all the patients, on the clinical trials with sincerest appreciation for their participation, thank you. And then additionally, to numerous collaborators and colleagues from Nanostring, Macrogenics, who provided the drug, my own lab group, our biostatistician, clinical trial team members, our GU department, and of course, the pathologists and the funding sources who make all of this possible. On that note, I'm happy to take any questions it's a pleasure to be here and to talk with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shandras. That was an interesting presentation on the tumor and tumor microenvironment in prostate cancer. We do have a couple of questions. Um, first, you showed preliminary data for the tumor microenvironment. Have you been able to use spatial transcriptomics to assess what happens in the benign prostate compartment of the B7H3 treated patients? That's a very good question. As we alluded to, we are looking at both the tumor and the benign compartment. Um, we are still in the process of fully uh, understanding that data, and there is more that we will uh, present, hopefully, in the manuscript and the potentially upcoming meetings in the near future. So stay tuned. How oh, exciting. Um, and another question, what is the main utility you see for spatial proteomics and transcriptomics going forward? I think that, and that's again another insightful question, the benefit of technology like this beyond even what's highlighted here um, stems from the fact that it can really operate on quite small amounts of tissue where before, if one wanted to, wanted to do potentially um, bulk RNA-seq or bulk 
uh, numbers, I would say, as we showed here, 40 plex IHC. If one uses sort of standard IHC or any bulk technique, that requires a bit of tissue. And for a lot of clinical applications and different tumor types, like for example, for metastatic uh, prostate cancer patients, when we get biopsies, we get very little uh, sometimes tissue that's left over beyond any clinical use that's used for, that's useful for research purposes. And technology like this really allows us to potentially interrogate the changes in those small amounts of tissue for multiplex IHC applications, as shown here, or for transcriptome applications as described, beyond what one could do with just a standard single or FFP slide or two or three FFP slides. So that's one. It's opening the ability to do more work with less specimen in the clinical arena, which we know is incredibly important for really advancing and understanding uh, therapeutics, especially immune-based therapeutics, in the body, in the translational and clinical setting. Uh, and then finally, additionally, given the power of the technology in terms of just spatially localizing uh, what is going on between, say, benign tumor areas as highlighted and in other combinations of ways, this opens a new area where combining single cell with spatial transcriptomic features really will help the field dig into trying to understand what's going on between cell types and where they're specifically located spatially in regards to the tumor, benign, et cetera, um, localized microenvironment. And I think that will be an incredible uh, resource for the scientific community going forward to use these spatial transcriptomics, spatial proteomics approaches to get that additional insight. That was fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for the answer. Um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Shandara, for your presentation. And this will conclude our session today. Thank you all for attending.